Welcome to Chris Parkin Shooting Sports. We've got Seiko S20 and 308 on review. Uh, I'll give you some range time video and then I'll give you a summing up video afterwards. You might get extra stuff in between, but you might not because YouTube do like to demonetize things for any kind of dismantling, re rebuilding, modification, using options. And on this rifle, we've got you know different fore ends, different butt stocks, various accessories like the handguard here. There's a, there's a thumb shelf on there large and small magazine size, five and 10 rounders. So we'll see, but um, keep with me and let's uh, see what we find out. This sporting barrel is 20 inches or 510 millimeters long. Muzzle diameter is 16 and a half millimeters and it straight tapers all the way back to the action. The barrel shows six 200 millimeter long flutes. Although it's described as a Picatinny rail, I think the action really could be more truly told to have Picatinny mounts front and rear. Seiko's own ring system works with an integral joining bar. The forend has quick detached sling swivel mounts on either side and also an underside stud for a common bipod fitting. It's also stiff and you don't get any intermittent barrel contact even when handled aggressively. I'm not a huge fan of the bolt handle shape but the 60 degree lift and travel is extremely smooth. The safety catch locks the bolt but there's a second button at the front so you can lift for a safe unload or go back into fire mode in a safe direction. Standard length of pull is supplied is 355 millimeters or 14 inches. There's a spacer system under the recoil pad to change that on the sporting version. Cheek piece adjustability goes up and down here and everything, although polymer on the outside, has an aluminium chassis within joining to the rear of the action and also at the front of the action on the fore end. Being a 308, recoil isn't severe, but the recoil pad itself is a firm homogeneous structure from top to bottom over the top of the spacers. It's grippy and fits well into your shoulder and stays locked in position. Quick release studs for a rifle sling are also shown at the back on the stock on both left side and right side. This rifle was supplied to me with a 3HGR sling branded up with the Seiko logo. It's an excellent sling and suits the rifle perfectly. You can see especially, it's great for a long carry. I'm a right-handed shooter, so the sling's mounted on the left side, and I've got the rear quick release stud mounted on the left side, and the front quick release stud also mounted similarly at the front. I'm still holding a bipod underneath on the underside stud. Here you can see the left side release catch for bolt removal. The bolt doesn't require the cheek piece moving to be withdrawn from the action. Although the thumb hole stock is right-handed, it's not impossible to shoot left-handed in a situation where a more versatile ambidextrous rifle is needed to make use of improvised rest positions. The shape of the adjustable cheek piece is absolutely superb with a very slim fit that fits under your cheekbone rather than displacing the side of your jaw. This keeps your eyes level and horizontal in alignment for better spatial awareness and balance capability. Although the rifle stock is smooth throughout, the underside of the forend and the lower pistol grip area here has a rubberized leather texture for better grip. The magazine release catch is at the front of the well and the mags pop in and drop out very smoothly, no problems at all with them snagging. The Seiko website advertises this as a two-stage trigger, but actually it's a single-stage trigger on my unit and I believe the two-stage may be an optional extra. It's adjustable from one to two kilograms, which is two to four pounds. And the one on my test rifle was supplied at 1200 grams. It's clean, crisp, has a smooth blade with comfortable operation. The blade is also adjustable three millimeters backwards and four millimeters forward for more appropriate reach to trigger from the grip position. Although I think the stock ergonomics start out extremely well anyway. The rifle shows a familiar Seiko cocked action indicator, which is tactile with your fingertips. I wouldn't say I was a huge lover of the bolt shape, but the handle length and operation of this bolt shaft itself are superb. I think I prefer a smoother teardrop shape because I don't feel the need for serration, or those in cold climates with heavy gloves might prefer that. You can see some of the modularity of the grip system 
and there's the internal aluminium within the grip itself which extends all the way to the back of the rifle. Seiko like to describe it as a hybrid rifle and although modular to some extent various elements of it are easier and more difficult to change over. The buttstock rear end is quite quick to change with just two bolts required for loosening and slotting the rear end off and the new end back on. The fore end swap is quite a lot more difficult and although it looks simple doesn't disengage as easily as you'd think and the rifle action and barrel itself is fastened with three screws into the aluminium chassis upon which the fore end slots. Overall weight of the rifle is 3.5 kilograms or 7.8 pounds. Overall length is 1040 millimeters or 41 inches. This is in the sporting stock format. It's interesting to note that Seiko have moved from the 75 action with a twin column magazine and controlled feed bolt face to the 85 rifle with a semi-controlled feed bolt face but now back on the S20 to a push feed bolt face again but now with a single column magazine just like the Tika. The stock looks like an injection molded polymer and is all the outer skins are but everything is bolted together using T25 fasteners and there is a 100% aluminium chassis bedding the rifle into a V-block centrally with the buttstock fastening on at the top of the pistol grip underneath the scope. That isn't the first time it's missed feeding. All fixtures and fastenings are 100% solid, although the fore-end is very difficult to disassemble and refit because different designs use a different skin on the aluminium chassis. Swapping the back end takes about a minute, the front end takes much longer than that. Now that magazine has been pressed in and clicked twice and both times under recoil it's dropped a little. I doubt very many people will go for both fore ends on it, although I can see that people will want to specify the buttstock as they prefer it and to some extent I quite like the ability to decide when you buy the rifle how you'd like it built but if you think you're going to buy a switch barrel gun or a switch stock gun I would avoid that thought because frankly it's easier to swap a whole stock with two action screws than all the different pieces of the Seiko S20 units. Various Seiko branded accessories available, all sorts of scope rings, a barricade stop, the tactical forend has M-lock rail on it which is really good for accessory mounting and if you do want to go for that gun I think it's a nice option but it probably suits a heavier barrel more. 5 and 10 round magazine options are available, also a muzzle brake which matches the barrel and you can see in some of these pictures. So, another box of ammunition, standard 308, all the rounds are loaded correctly, the magazine is clicked in position. We got it that time. So welcome to Chris Parkin Shooting Sports. Today we've got a Seiko S20 in 308. I've been delivered uh, both stock options for it, but I'm just leaving it on one for now. This is the uh, more sporting style thumb hole stock. And I'm shooting this with a selection of Federal and Hornady ammunition. Box magazine. Take it out to load it, can't load it from through the ejection port. That looks like it's going to take four rounds, maybe five. 
I'm not one for reading instruction books. Let's go for the fifth. Yes, it will take the fifth. And of course, you can put that plus one in the chamber if you need to. So, solidly clicked in position. It's got a nice release button at the front, which is easy to access rather than a, a press in button. It's cold today, so changes the handling ergonomics a little bit. The back to front stock length is good. Uh, recoil pad's nice. It's solid. It's firm. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't have hard spots or anything like that. The adjustable cheek piece, very nice actually. It's narrow, slender, goes under your cheekbone. It doesn't displace your jaw. Uh, the thumbhole stock is, well, it's becoming a little bit de rigueur, isn't it? Everybody wants to offer one. This one's injection molded polymer, but it's got a various elements of spine within it. The bolt is standard Seiko three lug, a 60 degree lift. So now that's loaded, we better pay attention. The Seiko trigger is very crisp. It's a unit that's seen across many of their range and it is a nice trigger. No qualms about that at all, and of course today, cold temperatures, it's nice that it's a little bit heavier, but it's still super crisp, so you can get good finger pressure on it and feel yourself squeeze it and control the shot. Three lug bolt, you've got a, a slightly sort of slotted bolt handle. It's not my preference, it's maybe a little bit smaller than I would like, but I'm not really one for serrations on bolt handles, I just find them a bit aggressive and unnecessary. Um, there are two bolts, top and bottom, under here, which allows you to remove the stock bolt release catches on the left side so the trigger magazine layout and everything like that is, is fairly conventional it's got Seiko it's got a rail on top but it's also got Picatinny now Picatinny is a big I'm a big fan of Picatinny it makes life so easy and this is Seiko's own mount which has got a separate um, a separate bar joining two rings and you can have 25.4 30 34 I think there's even some 36 mil rings you can get for it so I'm just gonna have a few more shots It does have a bit of a habit of not feeding. Now that took three reciprocations to get that to pick up that round from the mag. And the mag is in position, it is clicked in place. It's not the first time it's happened. quite stable under recoil, it's a bit icy today so a little bit slippery. It's more than happily accurate as a stalking rifle. Uh, I've shot maybe 20 rounds through it so far, given it a good clean and it's more than capable straight from the box but it is improving slightly as we go along. Let's try this last round. Yes, it picked that one up. Didn't get that one though, did it? So if I get my hand, press the magazine up. There is a round in there. There's definitely a feed issue with it. Again, magazine is in, cycle the bolt, it's got it that time. I wouldn't say it was yet stunning on paper, and it has been supplied with um, a Burris 4XE, I believe this scope's called. It's, uh, it's quite a high specification, more target oriented scope. So I've got 24 times magnification, parallax adjust, etc. Which certainly as an aiming solution for testing a rifle it is ideal. I wouldn't say it suited it as a stalking scope though. But that's enough for the moment. The rifle is supplied screw cut and I've been supplied with a Stalon moderator for it. Okay, first up we've got 150 grain Federal Premium.
I'm just going to take that sling off for the moment. Another missed feed. Got that one. Group number two, 165 grain Hornady SST. Quite fast that, slightly heavy bolt lift, but I would suspect that's an ammunition, not rifle issue. Group number three is Hornady 178 grain Precision Hunter ELD-X. Another miss feed. Quite a few miss feeds there. Now you might say, oh, why haven't you done this? Why haven't you done that? Why haven't you done the other? Well, I've had this rifle, I've set it up, I've cleaned it, I've mounted the scope correctly, and the thing is, I treat test guns like, you know, the average guy who goes to the, goes to the gun shop, buys a gun, a few boxes of ammunition, and tests it. And he doesn't, he isn't in the real world always going to be able to shoot multiple different types of ammunition, you know, cleaning shots, bore breaking, he's not going to be putting rounds off target to prepare the barrel for different ammunition and bullet types. So, although you might think this is a bit simplistic, I would suggest the vast majority of buyers of rifles haven't got the time or budget or capability to, to do such extensive testing as, as is shown to, you know, say, oh, this is the most accurate gun in the world. Look at my gun. Look how brilliant it is. That's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in is what does the average guy get from the rifle? Now, this, as it's been run in, is shooting better and better. That group with the 178 Precision Hunter looks quite strikingly uh, excellent on target. So, um, just to throw a couple more into the mix here, we've got some 168 grain um, ELD match ammunition from Hornady. This is the TAP ammunition, Tactical Application Police. For the guys who want to go to the range and you know shoot some long distance stuff, this might be the kind of bullet they want to use. 160 gra 168 grain ballistic tip, match bullet.
Right, just to throw a last one completely into the mix, this is 165 grain GMX from Hornady. This is the non-toxic or non-lead bullet. I've been told off in the past for calling them non-toxic. It would imply that lead is toxic. It probably is, but... It's interesting to note that this magazine feeds centrally. Often, from three lug bolts, you get a twin column magazine that will feed from, from both sides. It makes it easier to load because you can clip them in straight through the top as well. So, this last group might ruin all the others because it might spray them everywhere. We shall see. It's quite a heavy bolt lift. Well, that shot all right. But that bolt lift is heavy. Yeah, that's a, that's a high pressure round because we're getting some quite significant marks off the uh, off the primers and off the brass itself. Again, that's the ammunition. That's not the rifle's fault. That ammunition is pretty hot, and it is running quite fast. Two thousand six hundred and fifty-five feet per second for a hundred and sixty-five grain long, highly frictional copper bullet. Uh, that's generating quite a lot of pressure. All the red spots you can see on target are 50 millimetres in diameter and shot from 100 metres away. All these are three round groups because I believe a three round group is satisfactory for a stalking rifle, although Seiko themselves promise a one MOA guarantee for five rounds at 100 yards. Muzzle velocity for the 150 grain Federal was 2,701.3 feet per second average from a stated box velocity of 2,820. The Hornady 165 grain SST Superformance managed 2,682 feet per second from a suggested box velocity of 2,840. The 178 grain ELDX bullets from Hornady again did 2,537 feet per second with 2,600 listed on the box. The 165 grain GMX bullets from Hornady, the non-toxic or copper, managed a strong 2,776 feet per second from 2,750 listed on the box. But I have to say, extraction with this round was quite hard and there was some primer flow and extractor marks in the brass, suggesting it is running at very high pressures. Finally, the Hornady tap ammunition ran at 2,614 feet per second from 2,676 listed on the box. Again, you can see that shorter barrels, particularly noticeable away from the 150 grain bullets, do maintain better muzzle velocities with heavier bullets compared to the box stated data generally in a 22 to 24 inch barrel. You'll note it's got recessed quick release sling cups here as well as a bipod stud underneath which you can also use for sling and that forend is free floating and it's stiff as well so you don't get intermittent barrel contact on this fluted barrel. Seiko hammer forge their barrels, they usually are pretty good, same as Tika's. You can see the left side bolt release catch. Seiko's three lug bolt, which feeds off the top of that magazine. Now, I've not been utterly convinced by the precision of the, of the ammunition feed so far.
just going to find a find a round here. It's not a piece of brass. The interaction space there is is quite minimal, and I think it's quite a critical factor because that is the most interaction you're going to get for magazine feed. So if that magazine drops even slightly in its well, that's why we're getting a misfeed. And considering in its well, the magazine's got a good two millimeters of movement. Let me just see if I can show that on camera. That's got a good two millimeters of movement there which I think is the reason why when it sort of goes in fresh and it's right up that's fine but as it goes into recoil it drops a little bit and I think that's why we're missing magazine feed sometimes. I always think it's handy to know if your magazine runs dry and you need an emergency backup shot whether you can just drop one in the ejection port and it will feed and the Seiko does. I always think it's handy to know that when your magazine runs empty, can you feed a single round just thrown in the injection port? And you can with the Seiko. Just drop the mag out, try that one more time just to make sure. Yeah, that's going to feed. It's a sprung plunger ejector. So ejection force is consistent regardless of bolt speed. This one has separate rings that attach to the Seiko supplied bar that fits onto the Picatinny rail. This means you can take it off, put it back on, you've got no loss of zero. I've tried it and it's fine. The rifle as supplied was ideal in a hunting scenario. The safety catch and all operations were quiet, loading was silent, and although we did have one or two misfeeds from the magazine follower, these seemed to go the more the rifle was shot, as perhaps the magazine wore in. The five round magazine supplied with the rifle was a little bit more prone to the jams, whereas the ten rounder never once suffered a failure. Shooting the rifle from sticks was very stable, it gave incredibly comfortable head and shoulder position on the rifle, and the predictable trigger with a good 1200 gram trigger pull was ideal in cold conditions, with or without gloves on. Safe loading and safe bolt operation is assured by the safety catch and all round the Seiko S20 makes for a superb hunting rifle. Here you can see I've swapped the stock's back end for the more tactical unit with the monopod on it but I've left the front end well alone. So to sum up about this rifle, let's start with the good points. As a fundamental rifle and shooting system it's very good. Um, the immediate um, MOA guarantee from Seiko uh, took a couple of different ammunition tests to satisfy that. Five rounds, they call it 100 yards, I'm going to go 100, 100 metres, which is 10% more, but I still had no problem shooting sub-MOA at that distance. Uh, 178 grain Hornady ELDX was the one that did it for this rifle, I'd be quite happy to hunt with that. Here you can see we've got the optional muzzle brake on at the minute, this is the standard barrel, that's 5 8 24 threaded just like the barrel is. Um, what else can I tell you? Well, the more tactical forend is an absolute job and a half to fit because accessing the screws and things to swap it all over, given the fact that the action itself fits in this chassis, is a slightly confusing issue. I wasn't supplied with any instructions or anything of how to swap it, so you know I figured it out for myself. And it, it seems utterly impossible to swap the forends without completely disassembling the polymer outside from the aluminium internal chassis to access the three main action screws that fit the rifle into the stock. Swapping the back end is no particular hassle. Um, the top screw here does need an L-shaped uh, Torx wrench to do it rather than a straight one, but it's not a huge job and the bottom one goes in through there. Um, I had some problems with the standard five round mag um, on the range. It wasn't feeding very well because the magazine tended to stagger and stutter a little bit and it wasn't lifting the rounds all the time. 
I tried some of the additional magazines that were supplied to me, which of course, as a standard buy, you aren't going to get extra magazines. And the standard rifle in a sporting format is a five shot. This is a 10 shot additional mag. And they're all center feed rather than the older 75 Seiko or 85 Seiko, which had a staggered feed. To be fair, I prefer staggered feed because you can load them through the magazine ejection, so through the ejection port here. You can't on this one. You've got to take the mag out. You've got to load them from the front. I will say though, if you run out of rounds, you can chuck one in and it will close the bolt and it will you know, load properly without that. In terms of the core rifle, I like the ergonomics of it. Overall length, 1,040 millimeters, as it came as standard, it's 14 inch length of pull, 355 millimeters. Excellent trigger. This was a single stage. Uh, Seiko advertised a two stage, but this is a single stage. Generally, things like two stage are probably uh, optional extras. Um, breaks at 1,200 grams. It's rated at 1,000 to 2,000 grams, which is two to four pounds. Absolutely fair and dandy sporting rifle fodder. The cheek piece adjustment is good in terms of comfort, but I wouldn't say it was particularly easy to adjust. And if you've got to take it, you know, if it's in a sort of central position, you have got to remove it to get the bolt in and out. But it's not the end of the world. Um, in terms of value for money, well, the rifle is actually cheaper than I thought it was going to be, which did please me somewhat, because I thought if you'd have put this over £2,000, it would have been too expensive. Uh, as a starting price on the Sporter, I think it's about £1,650 to £1,700. The more um, tactical version with the, the larger stock on it is about £1,800. You can see this one's got various accessories on it, like the monopod, and with the other fore end, which I never put on in the end because it was just too difficult to start messing around changing. It's all on camera if you want to watch it on another video. Uh, you, you've got hand stops for that. You can put a thumb shelf on there. Uh, so there are all sorts of integrated Seiko accessories. Would I buy the rifle? Yes, I would. I think it's a nice gun. It's a Cerakote finish, which gives you a good, you know, solid grey look. Looks very nice. It'll be quite durable. Cerakote's good. This Picatinny rail, as Seiko call it, wouldn't appear to be a Picatinny rail, in my opinion. It's two Picatinny mounts. No problem with that on a sporting rifle. But please, why call it a rail? It's not a rail. The Seiko mounts themselves fit on this secondary bar, which joins them together. You can have those in inclined, um, inclined settings, I, I believe, because this one's actually marked up 0 MOA, so that would lead me to believe you can get inclined ones. And ring options are, you know, 1 inch, 30 mil, 34, 36 mil as well. So, yes, overall, it is a good gun. And I think, actually, for the quality it has, as a standalone gun, is right. I would happily hunt with it, shoot with it. I like the ergonomics, I like the sling swivel mounts. I, I, I like pretty much everything about it. What I don't like is I believe the switch, it's a, it's a swap stock rifle. It's not a switch barrel rifle. And although Seiko advertise it as a modular sort of design layout, I wouldn't consider it to be that. Because to be fair, there's no point swapping to a range-based stock layout from a hunting-based stock layout to go to the range with a 20-inch, you know, 510 millimeter skinny barrel um, to, to, to shoot long distance with at the range. On the other hand, as a sporting rifle, that's fine. Um, and I don't think that's a problem at the range, but it certainly doesn't make it a range rifle. So I don't really understand the marketing behind it. Well, I do understand the marketing behind it. I just don't agree with it. Um, personally, I actually prefer this stock shape. Although the thumb hole is it's a right-handed thumb hole stock. It's very nice to use right-handed, and I am right-handed, but I do like to be able to, to switch around with the gun anyway. And this one is more of a true ambidextrous format for if you require that. There doesn't seem to be any great weight penalty. I prefer the, um, the slight bag rider design with a, with a slight, even if a little bit tapered, butt hook on it. Um, but the good thing about monopods like these is if you drop them to sort of 45 degrees there, you can lock in really well with that. So I'll peep through there. You can lock in really well with that to, uh, to shoot with. So there we go. That's my opinion on the Seiko S20. I think the value's right. I think the gun is right. I just think the modularity explanation of it isn't perfect. I think it's slightly misleading. I will say the adjustable butt pad on the, um, the tactical stock is slightly better as well. Although you do get spaces on the sporter version so you can tailor length of pull as you like. So there we are. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe to my channel and uh, don't forget to comment on the videos. I'm sure some of you will disagree with me. Some of you will agree with me. 
Um, I do tend to polarise opinion, but isn't that what a reviewer is supposed to do? Not everybody will like it, some will like it. Um, question is, will they keep sending me rifles to review? Because to put it in as a fact, yes, the rifle is fundamentally capable. The modularity is questionable. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Thank you.